Hello, church family. Uh, it's great to be with you all this morning. My name is Nathan Holton. I'm serving as the college intern this year. I grew up in the church, left for four years, and I'm back, and I'm so excited to be with you all. If I have not had the pleasure of meeting you, or if it's been a few years, uh, please come find me. I'd love to connect with you and talk with you. Please turn with me uh, in your Bibles to F- First Timothy, the book of First Timothy, chapter 6. First Timothy 6, we're going to start with verse 17. This is the word of God. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides for us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be good and good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. O Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge, for by professing it, some have swerved from the faith. Grace be with you. Good morning, everyone. Hope everyone's doing all right. My name is Grant Glover, and I'm the college minister here at PCBC. We're glad you can join us this morning as we are wrapping up our summer sermon series on the book of 1 Timothy, which we've been looking at the paradoxical way of living that the gospel brings, how it turns the culture on its head. And we have saved maybe the most controversial and countercultural teaching for last. That's right. You heard the passage that was read. We're talking about money this morning. So I know, I know for many of you in the room, stress levels just got raised a couple notches, but don't worry, we're going to get through it together. And I know what you're thinking, oh boy, another one of these talks, why is the church always talking about money? Well, we don't always talk about money, but when we do, it's because Jesus talked about it so much, and we're going to explore why. Pastor Jeff shared this one with me this week, that 16 of Jesus' 38 parables deal with how to handle money and possessions. And so the question is, why does the Bible talk so much about money? Well, it's because God knows something about us, and that's that money is blinding. And let me explain why. You know, it's really easy to know if you're struggling with, let's say, lust or adultery. There are very obvious actions you can point to to know if you're struggling with those things. But what about greed? That's a lot harder, isn't it? It's especially hard when you live in North Dallas and you can always find somebody wealthier and greedier than you. And so to show, let me show you how blinding money truly is. Do you know what the median worldwide income is? $10,000. Travis shared this with us a couple weeks ago. And so what that means is if you make a year, you are in the top 10% of earners on planet Earth. And for my high school and college friends, you may be sitting there thinking, well, I don't make that much money, so this can't apply to me. Well, you may not make that much money, but thanks to a lot of your parents, you certainly live a lifestyle that is close to the top 10% of the world. So yeah, you're included in this too. I can see some parents out there giving me like a mental round of applause. (laughs) Yeah, you're welcome. (laughs) So, you see, as Dallasites, we are all unbelievably well off. And we're surrounded by people who are well off. So we kind of tend to think, I don't struggle with money. I'm not greedy. That's like Jeff Bezos' problem or something. But we totally are. We are the rich. And I'm definitely including myself in that. And we're just blinded to it because of where we live. We have no idea. And so that should give us a sense of freedom that that just means that in this room, we all struggle in one way or another dealing with our possessions and our wealth. And so that means we can come together, figure this out together, knowing that we have been forgiven of our failures already. We have the freedom to take a deep breath and talk about what our struggles are with our wealth. And we've heard many sermons on how the Bible tells us to give. Uh, we have also, it's also one of our core values here at PCBC that we share all that we have. But a question that may not get answered as often is, why? Why are we called to share what we have? Is it so that the church can make more money? 
Is it because God likes to give rules and wants you to follow them so you can please him? Is it because we should feel guilty for how much we've been given? Why can't God just give directly to the people who need it? Why does he call us to share what we have? We will answer all those questions today, but talk about why the Bible consistently tells us to share what we have. And in seeing the why, we'll get a little hint of what it should look like. So we will have the classic three points today, the three whys of sharing. Life, people, and heart. Life, people, heart. So our first reason we'll talk about why we are called to share is that it is where life is found. It has to do with life. As you saw in the passage, which Nathan read for us earlier, Paul goes through all these commands to the rich, us, in verses 17 and 18, and then he gets to verse 19, and he tells us the result of being generous and sharing. If you look down with me at verse 19, at the end of it, he says, so that they share, so that they may take hold of that, which is truly life. So he's saying that true life is not found in accumulating possessions for yourself. To find your life is to not spend your life chasing possessions and chasing money for yourself. That is the paradox. That is the countercultural teaching. To share what you have instead of keeping it is to find life. Now, how is that possible? Well, Paul gives us a few hints. If you look down to verse 17, he talks about that riches are uncertain. He says, don't put your hope in the uncertainty of riches. That's because money can simply vanish in an instant. And you can look to the 2008 recession to see that. Or you can even look at the great cryptocurrency crash of 2021, which have the net worths of all my friends. <laughs> money is uncertain. It can be taken away at any moment. And he also says in verse 19 that it... Not, it's not a good foundation for the future. You can't take it with you when you go, and anyone you leave money to can't take it with them when they go. And we know these things, but there's something even deeper going on here that's even more paradoxical. Money is not even fulfilling when we have it now. And he's, that's why he says in verse 19, he wants you to take hold of that which is truly life. So many of us strive to get to a certain level of income and what is the one thing we want when we get to that level? Truly, the only answer is more. Think about it. Tim Keller puts it this way. Money is like a drug. See, when you take drugs, you get a certain feeling of being high or a certain sensation of well-being. And as you take more, your body generates more tolerance to them, and you need more drugs to keep the same feeling going. And money is the same exact way. When you get to a certain level of wealth, you're able to afford certain luxuries you weren't able to before. You couldn't have them, and now you have these things and they feel great. But then what happens? Those luxuries, the, the new iPhone, new car, new house, new clothes, new fraternity or sorority, new internship, they become normal. They're not luxuries anymore. They're non-negotiable. So... Then the feeling of newness wears off, and it's on to the next thing. It's off to the next vacation, the next set of golf clubs, the next mass purchase of Lululemon clothing to bring the same level of contentment. Those were all aimed at me, if you couldn't tell. <laughs> so the idea is that you need more stuff to get the same level of contentment because luxuries become normal. And in Dallas, you can always find somebody who has more than you, making you feel like you need more. You see people having certain vacation homes or memberships, and you want them too, so you constantly think, I don't have that much money, even though you're making more than you ever dreamed and more than 99% of humans who have ever lived. Money is blinding, and the pursuit of it is ultimately unfulfilling. There's never a sense of fulfillment in the pursuit of it. You're just wanting more. So life is not found in accumulating possessions. What is found instead is stress, discontentment, and anxiety. Now, what gets even crazier is that people who have made it to the end of this pursuit, who have come to make so much that they really can't make any more, even they are left feeling unfulfilled. Don't believe me? Well, there's this amazing article written in the Village Voice in 1990 by the lady... 
uh, whose name was Cynthia Heimel. And she was a feminist satirical writer who was by no means religious, and she wrote for the New York Daily News, Vogue, and she even had a column in Playboy. And she knew, all, as part of her job, she interacted with a lot of Hollywood A-listers, knew a lot of them when they were just working normal jobs, and saw them become famous. Listen to the words she writes about them and their journey in her publication. I pity celebrities. No, I do. The minute the person becomes a celebrity is the same minute he or she becomes a monster. They were once perfectly pleasant human beings, but now they have become supreme beings, and their wrath is awful. It's not what they had in mind. They wanted fame. They worked. They pushed. And they stepped on the other guy's face. The night each of them became famous, they wanted to shriek with relief. Finally, they were adored. However, the morning after the night each of them became famous, they wanted to overdose on drugs. Why? All their fantasies had been realized, yet their reality was still the same. If they were miserable before, they were twice as miserable now. Because that giant thing they were striving for, that fame money thing that was going to make everything okay, that was going to make their lives bearable, that was going to provide them with personal fulfillment and happiness, it had happened. And nothing changed. They were still them. The disillusionment turned them howling and unsufferable. We are all striving for something that can't deliver on its promises. Receiving more possessions simply leaves you unfulfilled wanting more. And the people who have made it to the end of this game also are left feeling unfulfilled. So what have you been giving up in your pursuit of comfort? Have you sacrificed friendships? Given up hobbies? Neglected family? Material possessions just can't deliver on their promises. But what can bring you the life you're looking for? God can this brings us to our first point of why we are called to share what we have. God wants you to find life, which is in him. How is life found only in God? Well, Jonathan Edwards gives three reasons why a relationship with God brings life where money simply can't. Your bad things will turn out for good. Your good things can never be taken away from you. And the best is yet to come. Your bad things will turn out for good. God promises that the trials and suffering in your life, he will redeem and bring something good out of it. Money can't do that. Your good things can never be taken away from you. A relationship with God and being forgiven lasts forever, cannot be taken away while money can vaporize in an instant. The best things are yet to come. The Bible promises that you will spend eternity in perfect relationship with God if you're in relationship with him now in every last desire of your being, every last dream you've ever had will be fulfilled in a moment by the only person who can bear the weight of your contentment and satisfaction. Possessions and stuff simply cannot bear that weight. God doesn't tell you to be generous and share to ruin your life. He instead wants you to find life. The only life to be found which is in him. And that's why 1 Timothy 6 says, he wants you to find that which is truly life. So where are you seeking life, my friends? Are you trying to find something in what you earn or what you have that can only be found in God? We all struggle to place our hope and our sense of purpose in stuff, and we're trying to figure this out together. Now, do we only, is the only reason we share what we have because of ourselves? Is it just to make ourselves feel better? Well, no. Of course not. And that will bring us to our second point. The second reason we are called to share what we have. People. Look back down at 1 Timothy 6, where verse 18 commands rich people, us, to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. Now notice what this verse does not command us to do. It does not it does not tell us to reject money and never have any because it's all bad. You see, the gospel doesn't say that money is inherently evil. The Bible says in Genesis 1 that when God created the world, he called it good. And that means that material things, including money, are not evil in and of themselves. 
And that's why in verse 17, God says, it says that Paul says that God richly provides us with everything to enjoy. God has given you gifts to enjoy. He just doesn't want you to find your full sense of purpose in them. And so, having wealth isn't inherently wrong. He doesn't want you to find your full value in it. Now, before you get too comfortable, notice what else this verse does not say. It does, Paul does not command the rich to invest money in themselves and in their family. So he says to be generous instead and ready to share. And that word ready to share is a Greek word, koinonikas, which is the only time this occurs in the New Testament and is related to the word we know better, koinonia, which means fellowship. And Philo, a first century Jewish philosopher, he used this word to mean community-minded. So Paul is saying for you to be community-minded, not self-minded with your possessions. You are to be relationally driven with your money. Possessions are supposed to be viewed as things to be shared with others. Here's an important question, though. Why does God give us stuff to share with others? Why doesn't he just directly give to people? Why not cut out the middleman? It's because of koinonia. It's because of fellowship. God wants us to have relationship with him and others. He doesn't just want to do things for us. He wants to bring us into what he's doing in the world. He wants to bring us in relationship with him and others so that we can find community and find a relationship with him and take part in what he's doing. So the gospel says that money isn't a bad thing, but it also says it can't be spent all on yourself. You were called to invest in people, to reject finding life in the pursuit of possessions, and to live in a radical way that is the opposite of our culture, viewing money as an investment to be made in relationships. And this is our second reason why God calls us to share what we have. He wants us to have fellowship with himself and others. You see, he wants you to see your relationships as ways to share what you've been given. He wants you to invest in the same thing he invests in, people. What else is more worthy of your investment than people? What else is more life-changing, life-giving, and world-changing than investing in people? Our lives are built on relationships, relationships with God and relationship with others. The Bible simply tells you to view money in the same lens. Your possessions are, meant to be, are not meant to be kept private. Just like you need people in life, your money needs to be involved in people in your life. And so, God wants you to be strategic. He wants you to invest your capital in such a way that the most amount of people are impacted. So the question is, what are you investing in? Where is your capital going? Simply on yourself and your family? or investing in the lives of others in the community? How do you invest strategically? Let me make this concrete, and I hope to open your eyes to what is maybe the greatest need that exists in our world today, so that your capital, our capital, can be invested in the most efficient, life-changing way possible. The United Nations Development Program has come out with a multi-dimensional poverty index which tries to establish who in the world is in poverty and who is not. And what they've determined, after adding up all sorts of factors, is that people who are in poverty in the world, the poverty threshold is $1.90 a day. $1.90 a day. Do you wanna know how many people in the world that applies to? 1.3 billion. $1.90 a day. We are so blind here in America. And here's where this gets scarier. So one billion of these people live in what we call the 1040 window, which essentially covers North Africa and South Asia. And so it just so happens that these one billion people living in this 1040 window are also considered unreached. To be unreached means you do not have access to the gospel which means you don't have a Bible in your own language, or you can't go to a church to hear it, or you can't run into believers to hear about it, or all three. So what that means is while we can drive 10 minutes, see several churches, walk into any of them and hear the good news, they do not have that option. And that applies to two billion people on earth today. Now, 
Here's where this gets really disturbing. If you add up all of Christians' incomes around the world, 2% are given to charitable causes. And American Christians are roughly on par with that, about 2%. Of that 2%, 6% is given to missions, specifically. Okay? So that leaves about $45, well, $45, $45 billion that are given to missions annually. Do you want to know how much of that missions money goes to the 1040 window to the 2 billion people who have never heard the gospel? 1%. 1% of our missions giving goes to the people who will never have a chance to hear. And so that means that 0.001% of our income goes to people who make $1.90 a day and never have a chance to hear the gospel. The most desperate in the world receive our bare minimum for a lot of reasons. And that just cannot continue. The central story of the Bible is about God healing and redeeming the nations. And Jesus says in Matthew 24, 14, that before he comes back, the gospel will make it to the entire world. And yet here we are with two billion people who will never hear, don't have a chance, and they're receiving virtually nothing from a country that has been given so much financially. What are you going to do about that? As 1 Timothy 6 has been showing us, we've been called to share with the people that we're in relationship with. We're in relationship with. And in our ever-connected global world now, you can be in relationship with people from all sorts of places on planet Earth. So you may ask, what am I supposed to do? How can I invest strategically in this? Two things, giving to your local church and supporting international missions. The first, giving to your local church or PCBC, we talk about a lot. And every year we constantly give out of our budget to international missions. And in order to keep up in a post-COVID world with expenses of running a church and ministries and giving to international missions, more giving will have to be required. But... It cannot stop there. Your sharing can't stop there. What doesn't get emphasized enough is giving to international missions itself. And as we've seen, only 1% of our missions giving as a, as a country goes to this. So if we're going to address the 2 billion people who are living in poverty and have no chance of hearing the good news, then we're going to have to adopt sharing lifestyles where our capital stops becoming about us and trying to find fulfillment in something that can't be found in investing our capital in relationships with other people who are in desperate need of it. We've been given so much. And so, that's what God asks us to do, to invest this capital we've been given strategically. And at the bottom of the screen right now, you will see some of our international partners. So what I want you to do, take your phone out, take pictures of them, write them down, call our church offices, visit their websites, and consider partnering with God and investing strategically in two billion people who simply just don't have a chance to hear right now. Now, for my high school, my college friends out there, you may be asking, what am I supposed to do, Grant? I don't exactly have a lot of cash at the moment. Let me suggest one thing. You will have about five summers between the time you graduate high school and start your first job that are free. And what I ask is that instead of spending one of those summers going, either doing an internship or working at a camp, go. Go to the people who are unreached. Go to the, give up the one resource you have right now, which is your time, and spend a summer amongst unreached people, amongst the most desperate, and just watch what God does. One summer to go. So what are you going to do? What is your life going to be about? Find, trying to find fulfillment in something that can't bring you fulfillment? Or investing in people, finding life in God, and in relationship with other people? America and North Dallas are just going to have to wake up. I don't pretend to have all the answers. I just know that there's a problem. And what we do is we try to figure this out together. Now, you're probably right now experiencing a familiar feeling that comes in these kind of talks. 
guilt. Is the Bible trying to get you to feel guilty so that you give? Does God, want, does God give you stuff and tell you you should feel terrible for how much I've given you, therefore I'm going to manipulate you emotionally to give to other people? No. And I'm sorry if that has come across this morning. But that will bring us to our third point. The third reason why we are called to share what we have. The heart. While we don't have time to, do, to cover 1 uh, Timothy 6.20, it's, the ideas have been covered in other sermons. We're going to look at verse 21 to a simple phrase that Paul ends his entire letter with. Grace be with you. And here it is again, this idea of grace. Why does it keep coming up and why does it come at the end of him telling people to share what they have? Well, it's because we believe in a gospel of grace, not a gospel of guilt. And that's why 2 Corinthians 8, 9 says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. We don't share because we feel bad. We share because of how much Jesus has given us. That he loved people like us, greedy people like us. And he stepped out of perfection, stepped out of riches to be a middle-class citizen in first-century Palestine, to be abandoned by friends, to be killed on the cross for our sins. He gave everything for us. And that just melts our heart. It's his grace that he has shown us, the grace he's given, how much he loves us, that changes everything. It changes our heart. It's not about guilt. It's about grace. That's our third reason why we're called to share what we have. Jesus gave us everything, everything, which leads to a changed heart. Let me show you how this works. I came across this quote from a minister in the Church of Scotland in the 1800s. His name was Robert Murray Machane. And he tells people to give in response to Christ's grace. And then he has this hypothetical conversation with an objector. Ah, someone objects. My money is my own. Answer, Christ might have said, my blood is my own. My life is my own. Then where would you be? Objection two, you ask me to give to churches, to the poor, but many of these churches will not use my money properly, and many of the poor are undeserving. Answer, Christ might have said the same. Christ might have looked down over the lip of heaven and seen you and said, these are just wicked rebels. Shall I lay my life down for these? No. I will give to the good angels and to the undeserving poor. Not to the undeserving poor. But no. He left the 99 and came after the lost. He came after you. Objection three. All right. But the people I give it to might abuse it. Answer. Christ might have said the same. Christ knew that thousands would trample his blood under their feet, that most would despise it, yet he gave his own blood. Oh, my dear Christians, if you would be like Christ, give much, give often, give freely to the vile and the poor, the thankless and the undeserving. Christ is glorious and happy, and so will you be. It is not your money I want, but your happiness. We give not because we're guilty for what we've been given, but because of how much Christ has given us. There was nothing he held back from us. And even though we continue in response to that to spend money on ourselves, we keep on finding forgiveness over and over again. Grace upon grace upon grace. And that melts our heart. That changes us. So sharing is not about what God wants from you. It's what he wants for you. He wants you to share so you find life, that you're in relationship with others, and in response to him giving you all that he had. If our hearts are melted by this gospel, the world just simply will never be the same. Let us pray. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the life in you, relationships with other people, for all that we've been given. Let us remember that these are gifts to be shared, to find life in you, to invest in others' lives. Let our hearts be moved by your gospel of grace, how much you laid down for us, we would give to those who are in desperate need, who don't know you, and the world will never be the same. 
your name I pray. Amen.